Hello. I, good afternoon. I think it's afternoon. It's afternoon. Yes, on this gorgeous day. Uh, I hope you're having fun at the, at the festival. My name is Amy Stoles. I direct the Literary Arts Program at the National Endowment for the Arts, the NEA. And the NEA is a sponsor of the Writers uh, Studio, this stage here. And I'd like to uh, welcome you to the stage and uh, give the podium over for just a few minutes to my uh, boss, the chair of the National Endowment for the Arts, Dr. Maria Rosario Jackson. Thank you. So good afternoon, everyone. Awesome, I like it when people respond. Uh, the it's really wonderful to be with you all on this Saturday. What a wonderful way to spend a Saturday morning as we step into a new season. Um, the National Endowment for the Arts has supported the National Book Festival since its beginning. Uh, and we're proud to continue that support and sponsor the Writer's Studio stage where you are today. Um, at this year's festival, and we'll hear from a diverse group of authors. I'm delighted to note that several of our NEA fellows are at the festival, including three of our most recent fellows who were just on stage, and it was a wonderful conversation. Um, for those of you who experienced it, I hope you will agree. We're, we're very proud of them. Um, the NEA has a long history of supporting our nation's literary arts. And we do this through creative writing fellowships to individual poetry and prose writers, fellowships to literary translators making works from all around the globe accessible to American audiences, grants to literary organizations such as independent book publishers, book festivals like this, writing workshops, and other organizations that cultivate writers at all stages of their careers and help connect readers to contemporary authors. We also support partnerships that make possible national initiatives like Poetry Out Loud, a national poetry recitation competition, as well as The Big Read, which supports one book, one community reading programs in towns and cities across the country. As we emerge from the past two plus years of the pandemic, um, many of us have found escape, entertainment, education, inspiration, and connection through reading. Books and stories provide important outlets for us to consider our lives and the world around us in new ways. From my perch at the NEA, I'm excited about advancing artful lives, making sure that all people in our country have art as part of their everyday lived experience and making sure that the power of the arts informs our social and civic infrastructure. What I think of as the mechanisms and relationships that we rely on to care for each other. And our literary arts are so important to these intentions. Seeing everyone here today is inspiring. By participating, we're helping to build opportunities for all people to tell their own stories we're also cultivating the curiosity needed to have empathy and connection. What I think of as preconditions for the just and equitable world that we aspire to. It's a privilege to be here with you today to experience and celebrate the power of the literary arts. I wanna thank Dr. Carla Hayden for her leadership at the Library of Congress and the Library of Congress for making this event possible for more than 20 years. And with that, please enjoy the rest of the festival. Thank you. Good afternoon. Thank you. Um, I just want to ask before we begin, it's such a privilege to be here with Geraldine, but I want to ask before we begin, how many of you are here at the National Book Festival for the first time? Oh, welcome. Wow. Oh, fantastic. Welcome. 
How many of you have been here for at least three times? <laughs> oh, my, my, my. That's marvelous. That's, how many of you have been here for 22 years? <laughs> Look at that. That is fantastic. Thank you. Uh, my name is Marie Arana, and I am the former, uh, the inaugural literary director of the Library of Congress. I had the great honor to have that job before I left to write books, which is what I really do in uh, my real life. Um, and it has been a, a, a privilege to see this National Book Festival grow. I have been there from the beginning since 2001. Uh, when Mrs. Bush and um, Dr. James Billington uh, created this festival. So it's, it's just glorious to see you all here for this wonderful author whom I've known for so long now. You know her work, um, Geraldine Brooks. She is, I, I had the great privilege, Geraldine, of being on the jury that gave you the Pulitzer Prize. <laughs> <laughs> and the great privilege of writing the citation that was given to you. So um, I'm just, uh, it was a wonderful, absolutely marvelous book. If you have not read it, March, you must read it. Um, and there are so many books that you've written, uh, Geraldine, one after another um, that have been absolutely glorious plunges into the human spirit. Um, I want to ask you about that straight off because I'd like to go from big picture to the actual book that we're here to learn about and celebrate. But I want to ask you because, you know, with, with your books, um, and they have been so, so extraordinarily deep in terms of uh, history and the human spirit, uh, how is it, I'll ask you about history in a moment with the research business, but uh, how is it that you tend to go to questions that get to sort of the foundation of uh, who we are as human beings and where we've been and how the, the trials of a current period, whether it's 1665 or 2019, as in horse, um, how is it that you arrive at these subjects? Well, Marie, first I want to say what an honor it is to have you as my interlocutor here. Such a, a great writer and storied editor and um, champion of the literary arts. So thank, thank you, you for doing this. I think that my preoccupations really uh, were born out of my years in a newsroom as a reporter and then as a foreign correspondent. And as a foreign correspondent who covered wars and cl conflicts uh, in many different countries, um, the responsibility of documenting how the decisions that are made in foreign policy uh, in the blocks around this building play out in the ordinary lives of people all over the world uh, was a, a responsibility, but it was a privilege, and it was... Uh, the beginning of my fascination with the question of how people are changed by catastrophe and who are you in that moment when you're tested, when all the certainties of your life are thrown into the air, uh, when everything that you relied on as to what was expected of you is no longer true. And I wrote about that a lot in the contemporary lives of people in Middle Eastern countries, in African countries, in the Balkans during conflicts. And then I think I carried it with me uh, into fiction. What was the point at which you leapt from, because war correspondence is one thing, um, and the contemplative sort of inner, very solitary work of, of a fiction writer. Um, how was that transition for you? Uh, it was great. <laughs> <laughs> um, but, it, you know, I've... I've no uh, more combat, right? So. No more combat. Well, I, I've, uh, I've told this story before, but it is the true story, so I'll tell it again. Uh, I have the Nigerian secret police to thank 
not only for um, my eldest son, but also for my career as a fiction writer, because the two things were very much linked. I was in Nigeria covering um, Shell Oil's collusion with the brutal military dictatorship of Sunny Abacha and investigating a massacre of unarmed civilian farmers in the Ogoni region. And I collected the information about you know, the massacre. And then, I, as you do as a good Wall Street Journal reporter, I went to the military to get their side of the story. And they handed me over to the secret police and threw me in the slammer. <laughs> and I was lying on the concrete floor of a lockup in Port Harcourt, Nigeria, and wondering how long they were going to keep me and it occurred to me that I had just turned 39 years old and I had neg neglected to get pregnant. <laughs> <laughs> and I thought if they kept me for any length of time, I may well have blown that opportunity. So luckily, when they deported me after only three days, I went home and greeted my husband, Tony Horwitz, with great enthusiasm. <laughs> 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 and our oldest son was born the following year. And at that time, I no longer felt that I could or should go off on long, open-ended assignments to places where one might get thrown in slammers. So I had to find a new, a new gig. And, um, and I had a story in my head that had been intriguing me since the day we hiked into a village in the English Pennines and learned that in that village in 1665, the people had taken a unique decision to quarantine themselves rather than flee and spread the infection. And that decision of self-sacrifice meant that there was no case of bubonic plague that was ever traced to the Eme outbreak. And I wondered how they came to that decision, and I wondered what it was like to live with the consequences of it. And I'd been thinking about it a lot. Um, we were living at that time in the little village of Waterford, which is only about an hour and a half from here, a tiny community, and we couldn't even come to an agreement about whether the community notice board could be inside the post office or had to be outside the post <laughs> office, much less a self-sacrificing, you know, life-threatening decision. So. Um, when I sat down to try and write my first novel, that was what I wrote about. And lucky me, some people wanted to read it, so I got yeah. to keep Oh, doing. boy, did they ever. <laughs> so <laughs> so I, I want to ask you, because you've mentioned um, your husband, uh, the very wonderful writer, Tony Horwitz, uh, who was your, your fellow journalist. Um, and I, I, was, I, rem I remember you won a prize together for your we did. war we correspondence. Are. Yes, we And did. you met out in the field. We met in journalism school, in fact. Oh, oh okay, <laughs> all right. So, so you traveled that whole path together, really. Yes. And then you both made the decision to leap off and, and write books. S yes, somewhat. Uh, at different times, but that was the destination that we arrived at. Mm. So I, I share with you um, having a marriage that is also with a writer, and I want to ask you, because it's a very, very distinct kind of life, isn't it? Because you're both absorbed, and you're both inspiring each other, you're both talking about what interests you, and you're, you're sparking off each other all the time. Uh, tell us a little bit about that with Tony. Well, it was wonderful. So we had different work habits. He was a very restless writer, and he was up and down and all over the place. I tend to you know, just plant my backside in the chair and sit. And that, that drove him crazy, because <laughs> he thought I was being way more productive than I was. But uh, I would always, I, I just got into the habit of making my work day the school day. And I would, whatever point I was at, when the school bus arrived back, I would get up and start doing other things with the kids or making dinner. And I found that that was very useful to me because things would resolve themselves. That I, like those, those um, pictures that if you look straight on, you can't see the image, but if you look sideways, you suddenly see it. And that would happen so I could go back to my desk the next day. But he would finish somewhat later. And in recent years, you know, I had, I, it, was, it was the happiest moment of my day. I would see him coming from the barn out the back where he worked with his laptop closed under his arm, and I would open a bottle of wine, and our evening would begin, and it was all about discussion and laughter and 
you know, fretting about the affairs of the day and fretting about our work, and I miss that very much. Mm, I bet, I bet. And this was all in Martha's Vineyard, yeah. in which you've lived for Since how long? Since 2005. Since 2005, yeah. Yes, we became, uh, we stopped being summer people and became wash ashores in, a, in 2005. <laughs> and my favorite bumper sticker in the vineyard is, summer people and some aren't. <laughs> <laughs> That's wonderful. <laughs> so I want to talk about, because every book that you've done, I mean, People of the Book, Caleb's Crossing, Secret Chord, Year of Wonders, March, all of these books um, are her novels. Of course, you've also done nonfiction. You've done three books of nonfiction, nine books total. Um, but the, 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 the novels are all obsessed with history. You love the past and you love the way it informs us. You know, I'm gonna, I'm gonna push back You're on gonna, that. Okay, good, <laughs> good, good, that's what questions are for. Um, you know, I think I got, a, I got a love of history by osmosis from Tony, who was the real historian in the family. He really did love history and was a history major and all that. I didn't take a history class. I, um, uh, it's laziness. <laughs> so you don't have to go anywhere. You just go into your no, books. No it's, no, it's not that. You do have to go. You have to go all over the place. But it's the fact that there's a story, and it's ready-made, and you didn't have to think it up. It's something that actually happened. Mm. And it's something that actually happened that if you made it up, nobody would believe it. And it's those implausible truths from history, and it, you know, it's Mark Twain, I'm going to paraphrase what he said, but he said, fiction is obliged to, sp to stick to possibilities, truth isn't. <laughs> <laughs> and I love to find those truths. And then you've got the architecture of the story ready-made. So that's what I love. That is the gift that history gives me, is the architecture in which I can use imagination to fill in the gaps where the historical record has fallen silence or find the voices for the voiceless people who didn't get to tell their own story. Mm -hmm. Well, the magnificent thing that you achieve in Horse, which is really a marvelous book, a marvelous book. Um, I loved March. <laughs> and I, I, I really was passionate about March. I didn't think you could ever write a book better than that. But I think you have oh. with Horace. I think you have. Okay. Um, it, what it does, it, it takes, okay, you had to sit, I mean, you, you, ha you had a ready-made architecture, sort of. But you bring it into the present. And you bring it into the present because it still lives in the present somehow. Um, and there are issues that, very pressing issues, such as racism, that are still very much alive, even though the, the first part, the historical part of the book takes place in the 1850s, we're still facing some of this now. And that is, I think, a remarkable achievement on your part, Geraldine. Tell us how you arrived at the, this subject. Uh, I arrived at this subject because, uh, unlike sensible people who become horse crazy at 5 or 15, right. I became horse crazy at 50. <laughs> uh, I, I went on a trail ride. It was an ecstatic experience. Somebody offered me a horse, and I was stupid enough to take it. <laughs> and then that was all I wanted to think about. And um, Tony noticed I wasn't getting much work done because all I did was, you know, go to riding lessons and think about horse care. And uh... her horse is named Valentine. <laughs> so can I just ask a question before you answer this? Because I really want to know how many people here have been on a horse. All oh, right. see? Wow. Okay, then you all know there's no such thing as a free horse. <laughs> I did not know that. <laughs> and the horse was not close by that I was offered. The horse was in Mexico. <laughs> so I had to learn all about how you transport a horse across right. to... Yeah. And, and, but she was so beautiful. She was so beautiful. She was so beautiful she was in an ad, television commercial for a fast-acting cream to treat vaginal yeast infections. <laughs> so the horse gallops across the Mexican Altiplano, and the voiceover says, some things should be fast. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, 
yeah. then I happened to hear the story quite by accident of the, this remarkable racehorse of the 19th century, fastest horse ever at the time, greatest stud stallion in the history of thoroughbred racing in America. And that horse's skeleton had been in an attic in uh, the Museum of Natural History here in Washington and had just been transported to the International Museum of the Horse in Lexington, Kentucky. And I happened to be seated at a lunch next to the man who had transported it. And as he talked about this horse's career and what happened to the horse during the Civil War, I knew that I had the subject for my next book. What I didn't know was it wasn't going to be just a story about a racehorse, as good as that story was. As soon as I started researching the history of this horse, I learned that the whole thoroughbred racing industry of the time, uh, which was a national passion, the like of which we don't have anymore, uh, the closest thing I can think of would be the NFL if everybody had pads and a helmet because mm -hmm. everybody had a horse or was one generation away from having a horse in the 1850s. And they were passionately interested in these races and these great, um, great rivalries between horses. And uh, it was built on the expertise and plundered labor of incredibly talented black horsemen many of whom were enslaved or had been enslaved. And once I realized that and saw how integral they were to the success of Lexington in particular, I knew that I would have to uh, write about them because to do anything else, to center the story on the white owners, who are quite interesting people, or the white artist that painted the horse, who is an interesting person, and they're all in the book, but I could not erase that contribution again, and so I knew I was going to have to write about it. And then, having done that, given that I knew that I wanted to write about the science around the horse's skeleton at the Smithsonian and bring the book into the present, I could not leave the story of race and injustice in the 19th century as if it was something over and done with and something we didn't need to bother about discussing. So that's when Theo appears. Theo appears. Yeah, so in 2019, who is a mirror, really, to the whole story about race. Yeah, yeah. it's an extraordinary, extraordinary um, story. But it braids three things together, right? It braids the art world, for instance, because the painting, which is in a junk pile, which is recovered, of this magnificent horse with the black groom um, becomes one thread of the story. Then you have the Jarrett, the, uh, the groom himself, and his story is an astonishing story, really. Uh, and then you have the, the story of the, the woman who is, what would you call it, a forensic anthropologist, or? She's, she's an osteo, she's a zoologist osteopreparator at the Smithsonian. Who actually knows everything about bones and is obsessed with bones and, and is the person who is in charge of putting together again these bones that are sitting up in the attic in the, in the Museum of Natural History. So the, the braiding of all this, which goes from 1850 to 1950 to 2019, um, quite astonishing. So you, not only did you have to research, Geraldine, Jarrett and that whole world but you had to research the art world because of this painting that crops up. And then you had to research as well what happens with bones and things and how, do you, how, do you, how, does, how does the person um, think who works with bones in the way that, that uh, Jess does. Um, so lots of research actually in this book. Yes, this was uh, a lot of research and a lot of it was absolutely so much fun to do. Uh, Anybody here been out to the Museum Support Center of the Smithsonian in Maryland? Not many. It is a treasure house, you know, and I was lucky enough to be able to go and spend time there because of all the science and the collections. So what we see in the beautiful museums on the mall, it's not even the tip of the iceberg, it's the tip of the tip of the iceberg. 98% of what the Smithsonian has is out in suburban Maryland. <laughs> And when you're there, it is the most extraordinary experience because I was there to see uh, the osteoprep lab mainly. And 
but the things that are going by are so distracting. A triceratops head is on a gurney going one way, and a Dutch old master's painting is going the other, and then a Chinese palanquin, you know, from yeah. the 11th century. <laughs> and your head is just spinning, and, you know, I don't know how the people who work there concentrate on the job. <laughs> Well, you know, what, what's astonishing to me is that um, I, I really, I, I, I was reading your book and I didn't realize that in the back you had um, this sort of uh, character, uh, cast of characters who were actually real. I um, wanted to, I wanted, I, I mean, I love it in historical fiction when the author comes clean on what is the history and what's been invented, so right. I always do an afterward. But in this case, the connections of Lexington were so extraordinary, and their stories continue after the story of the horse, and I just wanted to give readers a sense of that. Mm. Um, since there's so many people here who have been on a horse and who love horses, could you tell us something about the personality of a horse and what you've learned? and? because I was speaking to somebody yesterday, I don't know if she's here, Jackie Mars, um, who actually is a horse breeder, among men, the many things that she does. Um, but she was talking about the, the, you know, this is not a vehicle. This is an animal with, with their own dimensions and their own passions and their own personalities. Could you talk to us a little bit oh, about Oh, yes. That? Yes, my horse has a lot of opinions. <laughs> <laughs> And I think that one of the most fascinating, I've always loved animals. Um, and we always had cats and dogs growing up. And we have such strong bonds with them. I see somebody has their friend right here. Um, and it, it's, it's such a powerful connection. But it's so much easier with a cat or a dog because, like us, they're predators. And so they look at the world straight ahead, eyes front, looking for their next meal. A horse is a prey animal, eyes side, looking all around for what's coming to make it their next meal. So to form that bond of trust and, yes, love, which is the ultimate thing that can happen between a human and a horse, it takes incredible focus and patience and um, so I wanted to convey something about that uh, in the bond that exists between Jarrett and Lexington. And it's such a great gift when a horse does trust you. Mm -hmm. And then, of course, you have to trust them as well because you're riding this prey animal, and the prey animal, quite rightly, can be afraid of something that it thinks is coming to eat it. And so you have to... They have to trust you, and you have to trust them back. So it's quite an extraordinary relationship. Hmm. Apart from, uh, from the history and apart from the, the actual plot, which is always fascinating in your books, you're also a master craftsperson with language. Um, your language is beautiful. It's, it's, it's extraordinary, really. Um, but I was impressed because I learned so many vocabulary words from, from <laughs> <laughs> I really did. I mean, uh, I had to write them down. Knackery, knackery, I did, with, starting with a K, knackery. Somebody worked in a knackery. Um, I had to go look that up. Um, somebody had a silver ferruled walking stick. And um, I could sort of, by context, understand what that was. But that was kind of a wonderful image. I didn't know the word ferruled. Um, the Russians do, that's what they poke into uh, their enemies when they... <laughs> um, <laughs> um, passerines from Kandahar in the, the osteo world. Uh, what are passerines? Um, and I never did look that up because I was so... In, tiny little birds. Tiny little bones. <laughs> like, yeah. Anyway, um, yeah, don't be afraid of the vocabulary because it's actually quite beautiful and, and quite... Um, quite uh, teach, it's a teaching experience. Well, it was fun to get into the language of horse racing because that I, I learned that so many of the expressions we take for granted come straight from the track, like winning hands down actually means the jockey didn't have to encourage the horse or whip the horse, hands were down. Right. So it's an easy win. A shoe in is when all the jockeys conspire together 
to let one win, so they shoo him in. <laughs> and the, tr the trick is to stop using the vocabulary. When you, when you learn a, an interesting, archaic word, I tend to fall in love with them, keep using them, and nobody knows what you're talking about. <laughs> and it gets, so my sons, I have a rule that you don't play lacrosse inside the house, which I think is a very reasonable rule. <laughs> and yet they were doing it. And I yelled at them and I said, you're vexing me with your ungirt behaviors. <laughs> And I go, Mom? <laughs> Chips off the old block. Okay. <laughs> so um, I, I want to invite you to come to the microphone and ask questions. We have 10 more minutes of this program. But while you're coming to the microphone, we'll take you one at a time. Uh, please welcome you to, to ask your Don't questions. Don't be shy. Yeah. Don't be shy. Um, I want to ask you one last thing, which is apart from the language, there is, the, well, very much a part of the language, but, but apart from the vocabulary, that specific stuff, um, you also capture something about the way people spoke, and I, I imagine you must have been reading a lot of correspondence to, to get the way that Jarrett thinks and speaks. It's, it's harder, you know, because enslaved people didn't have the opportunity to be literate uh, in, in most cases, and it's hard to find their voices, but there are a few places. I listen to a lot of the oral histories that were taken during the Relief and Works project mm. uh, that uh, are held in the Library of Congress. And it's not a perfect analogy, but at least it gives you some of a sense of the vocabulary of people who had been formerly enslaved and their memories and, and their preoccupations. The other place you find it, sadly, is in court documents because if they're taking verbatim transcripts, you hear people speaking in their own words. And so, you know, those are ki kind of sources that you go to and you kind of immerse yourself till you can hear the voices. Right, right. Ex extraordinary. Please, um, first question. Uh, hi. I want to thank you for your book. And I was wondering uh, what you thought about uh, writing about Cassius Clay, who is. Uh, Someone, if you just made him up, I don't think people would believe it. But. Absolutely, and we don't even get into some of the most extraordinary things in his life. Cassius Clay, we all know that that was the original name of the boxer, Muhammad Ali, and he, he apparently was named after Cassius Clay, the white uh, emancipationist from Kentucky. He was from the biggest slave-owning uh, family in Kentucky, the Clay family, very politically influential. And he went off to um, college in the North and came back as an ardent emancipationist, which is not exactly an abolitionist. He believed in gradual and legal emancipation, but he had freed all the slaves that enslaved people that he had inherited. And then founded a newspaper called The True American, which argued for the damage of the slave system, not only to the humanity of the enslaved, but also to the economy of the South. And he made these powerful arguments which led him to be, uh, have to fend off three assassination attempts, which he did in very dramatic fashion. So somebody shot him in the chest and instead of going down, he came at the guy with his Bowie knife and got the better of that altercation. <laughs> And then later on, he became Lincoln's ambassador to the Tsar's court in Russia and um, carried on with a ballerina. And that <laughs> ended his, his long marriage. And it happened that he was married to the daughter of the original, perhaps the original owner of Lexington. Although there's some question in my mind that Lexington may have actually belonged to his black trainer, but a black person wasn't allowed to race in their own name in those days. So it's fascinating, fascinating. Um, please. Oh, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. I didn't see you, sorry. Thank you. Uh, I'm just very impressed with the science that you brought to the story, the uh, bones and the different things that the stu structure of the horse made in relation to his blindness and so on. So I thank you for that because I think oftentimes we don't see the science behind what actually exists. Can you tell us a little bit of how you arrived at that? Well, I was a bit of a science nerd as a kid growing up, and a lot of what I've written about Jess and her trips to the, to the tip, as we call it in Australia, or the dump, as we call it in the US, that was me. I would go to the tip, and I would bring back specimens to look at under my microscope, and that horrified my mother. 
<laughs> and it turned out she was quite right because they were dumping dioxin at that tip we learned later. <laughs> Well, thank you for that question, because I didn't know that about you. That's good to know. But it was fascinating to talk to the scientists at the Smithsonian, and I borrowed all kinds of bits from what they told me and gave those things to my fictional characters. And, you know, I got so much help uh, from the Smithsonian. I'm incredibly grateful to them. It's such a wonderful uh, treasure that this country has provided. Well, you give them a very nice spotlight, I have to say. <laughs> I have to say, next question. How did you <clears throat> come upon Martha Jackson <laughs> and, then, and then also Jackson Pollock? Well, so that was, that was the unexpected turn that the story took. Who knew that if you set out to write about a 19th century racehorse, it would lead you straight to Jackson Pollock's car crash? <laughs> uh, it does. And one thing I'll say about this novel, the more implausible the thing is in the book, the more likely it is to be the true thing. <laughs> so that was, I came to the Smithsonian to, to visit the Osteo Prep Lab, and then I met the curator of American paintings who said, you know, we have an oil portrait of the horse, would you like to see it? And I said, of course, and it was in the study area and uh, not on public display, although here it is now, which is exciting. Um, and as she's going through the paperwork of this beautiful um, oil painting of Lexington, she said, you know, that's really, it's got an interesting provenance. It came to us in the bequest of Martha Jackson's collection. And every other work in that collection is an edgy piece of contemporary art from the immediate post-World War II period when our aesthetics were being remade by abstract expressionism, by op art, by all these new movements in art, and that was who Martha Jackson, who was a feminist pioneering gallerist in New York City, those were the artists that she uh, sponsored, befriended, promoted. She loved the edgier the better. She had a great eye for what was going to be the most important thing in art. And in her collection and her gift to the Smithsonian, every other work is an important contemporary work except for this one <laughs> obscure, totally traditional oil painting of, of Lexington. And I thought, why on earth did she have that? Mm. And that led me right into the roiling art movements of the 1950s. Mm. Which is a wonderful thread of the story. Uh, here, please. Hi. Uh, so uh, touching on an earlier question about, you know, uh, all the research you did on horse, uh, on bones and specifically horse skeletons. Uh, what was one of the most interesting things you learned and why was it that horse skeletons are a nightmare and it's a wonder that horses can even walk at all considering they walk on basically their fingers? I know. Yeah, yeah. so. <laughs> I know. It, it, can we re repeat the question? Yeah, so yeah. it's about horse skeletons and what you can learn from them and the, the mystery of how they even walk given the, the, the dimensions of their legs compared to the mass of their bodies. And it is true, you know, there's that saying, healthy as a horse, they are very poorly designed. <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, a lot, of, a lot of horses die of colic, which is just because they can't actually throw up. And so, you know, they, they get twisted. Anyway, um, very, very fragile legs and um, but Lexington's skeleton is very interesting because he has a massive backbone and a lot of space for lungs and we don't know about his the dimensions of his heart but I'm guessing he probably had a huge heart because great racehorses tend to so it's really interesting getting into all that ana anatomical study as well. What was fascinating to me also was that, that this horse, um, Lexington, was a stud horse after his racing days, and I think was sired 230? He, he sired more champion horses than any other horse, and that's really even more remarkable when you realize when uh, these progeny were being born, which is uh, when a lot of them were taken to be cavalry horses during the Civil War and never, never saw a racetrack, and when a lot of racing just wasn't happening because of the war. So there would have been even more champions, but of his sons, the one that comes immediately to mind is Aristides, who won the first Kentucky Derby, ridden by a black jockey, trained by a great black trainer. Um, 
uh, and he was a son of Lexington. Um, General Grant's horse, Cincinnati, was a son of Lexington. Preakness, after whom the stakes are named, son of Lexington, as was, uh, I think, three of the first winners of the Preakness stakes. So it just goes on and on and on. So these genes are still alive, yes. I assume. Yeah. yeah, amazing, amazing. Over here. Um, how do you deal with writer's block? Like, do I do it writer's block? Yeah. I deal with it by not having it. <laughs> <laughs> it's I, I don't believe that writers have any more right to have a block than a hairdresser has or a metal press worker. You've got to get up and go to work. Yeah. And it won't be good work every day. Sometimes it'll just be a mess. But you've still got to do it. It's like, I, I've got a lot of stone walls around me, and I think of it as building a stone wall. And sometimes you find exactly the right stone, and it fits perfectly, and the wall goes up straight and true, and you're really proud of the job. And some days you look around, and for the life of you, you can't find one that's the right shape. But you pick up any old one and you cram it in there and the wall is teetery and it doesn't look good and you have to bring in the backhoe and push the thing over. But you did the work and you have to do the work every day just like anybody else does who needs to put food on a table. I think journalism teaches you that. Journalism teaches you that. Good luck, good luck calling your desk from Tripoli and saying, I can't file about what Gaddafi was up to today because my muse did not arrive. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Please. Um, thank you again for being here. I actually read March um, when I was 15 because it was required summer reading. And I'm sorry. <laughs> Immigrants, but I didn't know too when to win the, the Pulitzer Prize. But I was curious if you had any sort of um, viewership in mind for the books you're, you're reading, because I think sometimes we have this idea that you know these award winning books have to be adult and have to be you know kind of intimidating. But again, as a teenager, I did truly enjoy it, and it did start off a, a love of, of storytelling and weaving. But to my question, if you have an idea of a viewer of who you have in mind or a reader when you're making Do I books. have a reader that I have in mind? Mm -hmm. It's me. <laughs> no, I do. I'm, I'm, I'm a bit selfish that way. I write the book that I would want to read. And so, you know, uh, to the extent that it then connects with other people, I'm just incredibly grateful for that. Yeah. But thank you for saying that it didn't... Um, put you off <laughs> having it assigned. I always think, oh, that's the kiss of death for that. That's a great answer because that was, the, that was really the answer that David McCullough always gave because he was writing about people, you know, uh, John Adams, Truman, who had been written about millions of times. And, uh, but it was, you know, I haven't read the one that I want to, I haven't read one that I would want to read and I'm going to write that one. Right. So, yeah. Well, I like to be mentioned in the same breath as my late neighbor. Oh, yes, who, yes, yes. He, he lived uh, just very close to us in West Tisbury, Martha's Vineyard, and he was a lovely man, and his wife Rosalie also, and a pillar of the community. And I love that um, last night the opening of this festival was in tribute to him. Yes, yeah, yeah. great contributions to, to history. Please. Um, could you tell us a little bit about your writing process in terms of juggling the research with the writing and literally how you physically deal with your piles of research and papers and articles and, and go back to your writing? Sure. Uh, you know, like I said, I, my, work, my work day was defined by the school bus for many years and I tend to stick with that pattern because I, I know it works, that you will get a book done if you work the school hours every, every day. Um, uh, my process is best summed up by somebody else who's a wonderful sculptor called Sarah Z, who was at the Radcliffe Institute when I was there, and somebody asked her about her process of making sculpture. And she said, my process is mess, 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 art. Mm. <laughs> So and I great. love that mm. because you can make a mess every day. Yeah. You can't make art every day. But if you don't start with the mess, then you can't ever get to the art. So. That's beautiful. That's so true. That is so true. 
Um, wh who is it? John Gregory Dunn who said, writing is laying pipe. <laughs> basically laying pipe and you're getting it straight and, and, um, and then, you know, suddenly you have an, architecture, uh, an <laughs> architectural structure, absolutely, yes, thank you. Actually, my question is very much connected to the lady's question. I've read all your novels and every time I'm looking forward to the next one and uh, I'm not only fascinated by the stories, but also by the structure of your novels, because they bring every time something new and the way you put those chapters together. So when, what moment in your writing process do you decide who is telling the stories and how you structure? Because it's very interesting. You always bring something new in so almost each novel. I can't usually start until I know who is going to be the storyteller. And that generally, I like to write with a first person narrator. There aren't, there's only one in horse, but generally I prefer that because of the immediacy of that voice that you're, you're with that uh, protagonist in an intimate way. And I have to figure out who is going to agree to rise up out of the grave and start speaking to me. And until I can hear the voice, I can't really start because how she sounds tells me who she is, and who she is tells me how she acts, and how she acts will set the plot in motion. So that's the first step. But I don't generally research much beyond enough to get started because I don't want the research to drive the story. I want the story to tell me what I need to know. So I start writing immediately, and then, um, and then I come to something where I don't know and I have to go and find it out. And so I'd go and do that bit of research and come back and write until I get to something else I don't know. Geraldine, I'm afraid we're out of time. My timekeeper is telling me we don't have time. I can well, see you on the signing maybe, line. Maybe one short question. One quick one. Uh, what ideas are you tossing around right now? Oh, I, uh -huh. <laughs> Okay, this will be That's short. This will be short because I'm not quite ready to talk about it. But my next book will be um, will be uh, nonfiction, and then after that, I have another historical novel in mind, and it's inspired by a piece of furniture. Uh, and that's all I'm going to say about that. But thank you, Geraldine. Thank you so much. <laughs>